Hello everyone, this is Timothy Mark with Alexandria. How's everybody doing today? I hope you're having a great day. And we are World Paranormal Research Society. The website is worldparanormalresearchsociety.org. And the Gmail for all you people out there is worldparanormalresearchsociety at gmail.com. And the, this, this podcast plays on Spreaker.com, iTunes, sometimes Tumblr. Uh, and it plays on YouTube. So if you're listening to this on YouTube, like and subscribe to the channel. Although we get more listeners off uh, Spreaker. But uh, anyway, so today we're going to talk about shapeshifters. But before we get into that, we're going to talk about people and how they like to just post shit on your wall. And uh, when you try to post shit back, on their wall, they on on when we say wall, we're talking about Facebook, of course. Uh, they get all butt hurt and they want to uh, block you from Facebook. Well, to and me, that's very immature. But I'm not gonna stoop to that level. It's one difference to block the person that you have something against that that you have a problem with on Facebook, but then when you block somebody else who hasn't done anything. That's a whole different issue, and uh, I don't really understand it, but uh, I'd never initiate anything like that on Facebook. Uh, there was a post put up uh, early yesterday, and my name was mentioned in the post, and I kind of let it go. I even liked it, and then uh, later on, there was another post that was put up about me uh, that I thought was very disrespectful. Uh, when you put my name attached to it considering what the song is about and so uh yeah so i decided i was going to put my own post up since this person had did two posts so you're talking about a tit for a tat well it, well, well, it was two it was two, <laughs> two tats tits. Two, tits. two tits for a one tat no 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 it was two tats so it was a tit mm. for two tats so uh i only did the one and then about 10 minutes later i was blocked so uh wow and not just I got blocked, but then you got blocked. I, I woke up to being blocked, so I figured, okay, I don't know where that's coming from. But very immature, and I'm certainly not going to subscribe to uh, those kind of uh, antics or games. You know, I've graduated kindergarten long time ago. I've never done anything to be disrespectful to this individual. But you know what? People and I will issues. say that I will say that that you've never done anything against this person. You always talk positive about this person, and then they decided to block you along with me. So that was well, I, that was a little I, I, weird. I, well, I don't judge people. I don't no. prejudge people, even though I may know information about people. It's not my place. I just treat everybody like a fellow human being on how I would like to be treated. And you know, you 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 know, you don't do anything, and I just refuse to be drawn into that drama. Okay, now let's end that. Time. Topic. Now, another topic I want to talk about because when we did the Dr. Rebecca, what was her last name? Foster. Foster show, and I asked of her about my health problems. Uh, she mentioned auto immune. Uh, immune. Well, I just wanted to clarify that with my health problems. I don't really. I know that autoimmune uh, refers to many different things. It could be many different ailments. But my, I'm going to go ahead and just let people know out there what my health problems is right now. I have a health problem with my gallbladder and what's going on with my gallbladder is producing too much bile to for my kidneys to clean I could become way more severe uh, my vision has been come, becoming blurred uh, so it's definitely affecting me in, uh, in, in, in negative ways so I have to have the gallbladder removed and I will but that that is my health issues I don't know if that falls into the category of uh, autoimmune system. Maybe it will after the gallbladder is taken out. Maybe. Uh, I, I don't really know. But a funny thing that happened last night. Let me tell you this. I got to tell you this story. I got to let everybody know this story that happened last night. So, okay. I'm a smoker. I'm trying to quit smoking. But anyway. So, I, I, I usually go outside at night and smoke. So, I went outside to smoke last night. And it was dark. And uh, 
we have a mobile command unit which is a travel trailer and so we're in an RV park backed up to the woods and uh, I go outside to smoke and when I turn around and light my cigarette I see a snake a medium sized snake shoot out from underneath the uh, travel trailer onto a wheelchair I have a wheelchair there because I technically I'm supposed to be using the wheelchair because I was injured when I was in the military had uh, two bad injuries to my left leg uh, two different years in a row so uh, you know sometimes I use it sometimes I don't but anyway so the uh, the snake comes out from underneath the travel trailer and goes towards the wheelchair now I can't see it because it's in the darkness <laughs> so I'm standing out there and I'm thinking okay this is a rattlesnake I could get bit by it so I started knocking on the window and I, it takes forever for Alexandria to finally acknowledge me in, in, and I let her know I need a flashlight so she comes outside with the flashlight and I said hey there was a snake that just came out from under here and she says oh well I better go back in then. <laughs> and she walked right back in and took the flashlight inside with her and that's why now I'm still in the same situation because I can't see where the snake went and I know that this thing if it bites me is rattlesnakes are poisonous so yeah, she... that, that was a little bit, you know, in my defense, I'm a Canadian and where I come from in Canada, we don't have poisonous snakes. We have beautiful garter snakes. And all of you may or may not know, I love snakes uh, to the moon and back. And, uh, you know, I forget where I am sometimes and I walk with flip flops, not realizing that there's poisonous snakes out there. And uh, I forget. But, uh, you know, we have a little uh, flashlight by the door and I just assumed if it's dark, he knows more than I do that there's poisonous snakes snakes in you'd want to take the flashlight with you right but what he's been saying to me is I have not seen a live snake yet I'm hoping and praying I can at a distance I've been just seeing uh, I think I've picked up one small mummified snake so far for my collection very kind of disheartened that I'm not seeing any but uh, well she didn't stick around last night to see it well, she it's came pitch, back in it's pitch dark baby yeah, and I can't, yeah, I can't we, see we, in the we dark we don't know where the hell the damn <laughs> thing went but she took the light weather and left me out there in a bad situation so I became Indiana Jones and made my way to the steps and got back inside the camp. So it was a really kind of earth-shattering uh, experience for him. And hopefully if he does go out for a smoke when it's dark, I, I kind of moved the little flashlight. Maybe he'll he'll see it and he'll make use of it. But, uh, you know, I love snakes. I respect snakes. And uh, I'm hoping to see a live one at a distance where I'm not going to get uh, bitten and having to go to the hospital. Now that we're sort of on nature and snakes, I want to sort of bring... This Earth Day is coming up. Earth Day. April 21st is Earth Day all around the world. Uh, when my son Nicholas was small, we participated every year in a massive Earth Day um, event. We had Earth Day auctions. We were in planting, flower garden contest, you name it. So Earth Day is something that's near and dear to my heart. And I just came back from a walk prior to the podcast to get something. And I thought this was completely amazing. And uh, uh, this is from American Spirit Tobacco Company. And this was by the till and it's called Seeding Change. Well, hold on. For the American audience, the tills, the cash register. Till, we call tills in Canada, sorry, I forget sometimes that uh, I'm not in uh, Canada anymore, <laughs> or like Dorothy says, I'm not in Kansas anymore, but at the till, they had these awesome little packets from American Spirit uh, Tobacco Company, and I, I was just blown away, and I took one, I thought I took three, but I only have one intact unit. And what it is, is uh, they say on here, this is sort of like a, a little um, Ziploc type of uh, container. And it says, the world is a more beautiful place without cigarette butt litter. So they've given you a little uh, disposable uh, unit for putting, uh, thank you for disposing of your cigarette butts properly. And they go one step further. And it says, this Earth Day, let's celebrate nature's beauty. And they give you a paper, and it's a seeded paper. So you plant this seeded paper under loose soil, you soak it, and then it's a sheet of wild flower seeds. So I think this is absolutely ingenious. And uh, I'm going to try and pick up a few more of these if I can, because these are a brilliant idea where a cigarette company is trying to have people dispose of their butts uh, more uh 
uh, economically and environmentally friendly and then they're giving you some uh, wildflower seeds in front of that inside the package so I think it's just absolutely wonderful that they're doing that yep that's good that's good we should all do our part and respect mother nature and uh, not destroy the planet and any kind of small step is a huge step in the preservation of our planet but now that we're talking about mother nature again we're going to go into today's show Which about shape, shape shifters. shifting or and shape I like shifting to talk people. about the one that shape shifter that people has been knowing you uh ever since what probably the 60s plato you can definitely shape shift some plato Ha ha ha! But talking okay. about well, no, yeah, that's, no that's, that's, I have an idea. <laughs> that's of a, a joke, folks. No, I have an idea of a shape shifting play doh. Remember, I I made you a stress ball of play doh. So I'm not going to give the recipe. I might do a demonstration in a later podcast. But that's a unique idea of shape shifting the form of play doh into something that's useful as a stress ball. So let me start it off the show here with a story going all the way back to Europe in the 1700s. Uh, the different countries there the uh the thing is the people of europe the citizens as a whole almost all over europe believed in shapeshifters all the way in the 1700s and they believed that women were shape-shifting into werewolves they really believed that and so uh there's a story that goes back that actually these women would go into the woods and people would follow them in there and then they would get killed by these uh these wolves and they figured the women were shape-shifting in the wolves but later on it became women and men were doing this and one man was actually caught and what he was doing was wearing the hide of a wolf and he was dressed up like a wolf but he was acting in a very wolf-like manner and he was killing people wow that's that's kind of uh, interesting and on to that note as you know I always like to talk a little about uh, um, mythology folklore and history and in mythology folklore and speculative fiction shape-shifting is the ability of a being or a creature to really completely transform its physical form or shape and uh, this is usually achieved through an inherent ability of a mythological creature a divine intervention or the use of magic so what they're really saying in that statement that the ability to shapeshift or transform yourself from one creature to another is through divine intervention or the use of ma uh, magic and really the idea of shape-shifting is present in the oldest forms of totoism and shamanism as well as the oldest uh, literature and epic poems talking about the epic of Gilgamesh and the Iliad as well where the shape-shifting is usually induced by the act of a deity and again the idea persists through the Middle Ages where the agency causing shape-shifting is usually a sorcerer a witch and then into the modern period and it actually you know remains sort of a common theme in a lot of modern fantasy children's literature and very popular works of popular culture and uh, there's just so much on shape-shifting and if we go into um, popular shape-shifting creatures in folklore are werewolves and vampires mostly of European Canadian and Native American and early American origin all right I want to talk about something the Titan Métis the first wife of Zeus, and yet spelled M E T I. I have that on my. That's the tattoo I have on my my chest. And the first wife of Zeus and the mother of the goddess Athena was believed to be able to change her appearance into anything she wanted. In one story, she was so proud that her husband Zeus tricked her into changing into a fly. He then swallowed her because he feared that he and Métis would have a son who would be more powerful than Zeus himself. Métis, however, was already pregnant. She stayed al alive inside of his head and built armor for her daughter. The banging of her metal worker made Zeus have a headache. So, Hephaestus, I can't even pronounce his name, 
Thaddeus clove his head with an axe. Athenia sprang from her father's head, fully grown and in battle armor. So that's one in Greek mythology. And also in the Norse mythology of Loki, Loki is known as a shapeshifter as well. And really shapeshifting to the form of a wolf is specifically known as lycanth lycanthropy. And uh, such creatures who undergo such a change are called lycanthropes. And uh, we go into even people that are able to transform mortals into animals and different plants. And the other terms for shapeshifters uh, in the Navajo is skinwalker. I know a lot of you may have uh, heard of the term skinwalker with the Navajo Indians. And um, just so many other ones. Even um, you've mentioned about the Greeks and about Tites as well. Uh, the uh, Greek Zeus again and we're talking about even where I want you to really kind of look up this word Métis and Métis from where I come from is I'm half Aboriginal and half Sco Scottish where uh, we believe in a lot of indigenous cultures believe in the Wendigo as a shapeshifter as well but I'm going to go into Wendigo a little bit later in the show because that's just a different form of a shape shifter and um, actually Medusa turned to a monster for having sexual intercourse with Poseidon in Athena's temple so we have so many other uh, different shapeshifters through other different civilizations and uh, on and on and on but I'm going to go into uh, more of um, Britain and Ireland because uh, that's part of my Celtic heritage as well as well fairies witches and wizards were all noted for their shape-shifting ability and but I want you to know that not all fairies could shape-shift some were very limited to changing their size their forms and some could be glamorous and some were just allowed to create illusions and uh, it is said that witches could turn hairs in that form and they could turn witches could turn into hares or rabbits and uh, steal milk and butter and uh, many British fairy tales such as Jack and the giant killer and the black bull of Norway features uh, shape-shifting as well in our Armenian culture Armenian mythology shapeshifters include the Nahang a serpent like river monster that can transform itself into a woman or a seal and would drown humans and then drink their blood. And so uh, that's an Armenian. And I really think that a, a mermaid is a, a shapeshifter as well. And uh, Scottish mythology f uh, features shapeshifters which allow the various creatures to trick, deceive, hunt, and kill humans and water spirits such as the each. Uh, usage which inhabited the locks and waterways in Scotland were said to appear as a horse or a young man and other tales include Kelpies I actually have a, a Kelpie tattooed on me as well and they would emerge from locks and rivers in the disguise of a horse or a woman in order to ensnare and kill the weary travelers so Scottish Ireland have a lot of uh, myths in regards to shape sh shifters as well and in ta Tatar folklore you have the Yuxa Y-U-X-A, a hundred-year-old snake that can transform itself into a beautiful young woman and seeks to marry men in order to have children. So female snake. Very close to what they are anyway. Hey, uh, and so yeah. And then we, we touched a bit on uh, Norse as well and we were uh, Odin and uh, Loki would taunt you taunt each other with having taken the forms of females and nursing offspring to which they had given birth. So there's a 13th century Eda relates to Loki taking the form of a mare to bear Odin's steed which was the fastest horse ever to exist and also the form of a she-wolf to, to bear Firin as well. So that's just in the north. Uh, tradition as well and you go on and on in regards in to Argentina in Argentina culture you also have it but in Argentina uh, it's usually people that re practice sorcery 
have been transformed into pumas or jaguars and, and that's the legend of Argentina and Chile. So if you really think about it, all these different cultures and time frames that we've brought to you, again, since the beginning of time, there has been a form of shapeshifters of some sort. And again, in Scandinavia, uh, there existed, for example, the, the famous race of the she werewolves known with the name of, and it's spelled M-A-R-A-S. And they were women who took on the appearance of took on that appearance of the night looking for huge monster half human half wolf if a female at midnight stretches the membrane which envelops the foal when it is given when it is brought forth between four sticks and creeps through it naked she will bear children without pain but all boys will be shamans and all girls will be these uh, female werewolves so people that shapeshift they gain or obtain ability, abilities in the new form. Berserkers were held to change into wolves and bears in order to fight more effectively. In many cultures, evil magicians could transform into animal shapes and thus skulk about. So people could, uh, if they were fighting, could transfer form into wolves or bears and get their powers their strength and win battles that's at least in these myths and for me being a, a 50 percent aboriginal or indigenous uh, culture i grew up with stories and i'm going to sort of shift now to what we call wendigo and uh when it's it can either be spelt w-e-n-d-i-g-o or w-i-n D-I-G-O, Wendigo. And really in Algonquin folklore, the Wendigo is a mythical cannibal monster or an evil spirit native to the northern forests of the Atlantic coast, the Great Lakes region of both the United States and Canada. And uh, the Wendigo may appear as a monster with some characteristics of a human or as a spirit who is possessed a human being and made them more monstrous and um, historically they're all, always uh, associated with cannibalism murder insatiable greed and uh, the cultural taboos against such behavior so they're really a legendary creature uh, in the United States in Canada and uh, you know, a fun fact, we're going to put a fun fact on this serious topic here. In The Hobbit, the prequel to The Lord of the Rings, the character Bjorn is normally a large human, but can shapeshift into a large bear. Uh, and, and we talked about this, that, that's one fun fact. Another fun fact, we talked about the movie The Thing. Uh, it, and it concerns a shape-shifting alien life form that can assume the memories of any creature it absorbs. And I like the original movie, The Thing. Yeah, that was a good movie, too. And uh, back to kind of the Wendigo legend. And the legend lends its name to the controversial modern medical term Wendigo psychosis. And this is actually a psycho psychosis that is described by psychiatrists as a culture-bound syndrome with symptoms such as an intense craving for human flesh and a fear of becoming a cannibal. And in some indigenous communities, en environmental destruction and insatiable greed are also seen as a manifestation of the Wendigo psychosis. So with all the um, forests being deforested and we have all these pipelines uh, built by these oil companies, this is what a lot of indigenous communities see as a manifestation of the Wendigo psychosis. And if you look at witchcraft or sorcery as a form of uh, somebody using them, that magic to transform themselves into something else, usually that includes animals that are tricksters, such as the coyote, but can also include other creatures. And uh, they usually, usually, usually those creatures that it would, uh, 
be used in sorcery are ones that would uh, have bad omens and uh, be associated with death or bad omens. So it was really a malevolent. And if you look at skinwalkers, they may skinwalkers may be male or female. Skinwalker stories are told mostly among the Navajo children. I know you mentioned that earlier about the Navajos. We right. About, and so they, uh, in the Indian community, uh, they definitely believed in skinwalkers. I don't know if they still believe that today. That's a legend. I, th I think they do because uh, uh, when we're talking again about uh, Wendigo as well, um, my, aunt, my uh, indigenous background is Cree. And among the Cree people, um, the Wendigo was strongly associated with the winter, the north, and coldness as well as with famine and starvation and uh, there is a Basil Johnston who is an Ojibwe teacher and a scholar from Ontario in Canada gives a description of a Wendigo and uh, this is what he has to say the Wendigo was gaunt to the point of emaciation it's um, I guess dissected skin pulled tightly over its bones with its bones pushing out against its skin its complexion the ash gray of death and its eyes pushed back deep in its sockets the windigo looked like a gaunt skeleton recently disinterred from the grave what lips it had were tatty tattered and bloody unclean and suffering from uh, suppressions of the flesh the windigo gave off a strange and eerie odor of decay and decomposition of death and corruption and that was his uh, description of the windigo so if you go into the history of the uh the werewolf and people that typically when you first seen the werewolf actually believe it or not it was around the years 27 through 66 27 through 66 so um, and then uh, they became very very what more widespread in 1150 and, and 1228 uh, it was very popular in the folklore of the European communities and uh, it was the Christians who actually were classified people as werewolves in order to kill them so that that could be a a conspiracy theory all to his own in regards to them trying to get rid of these people by just classifying them as werewolves yeah and belief in werewolves developed in parallel to the belief in witches in the the course of the late middle age middle ages and the early modern period like the witchcraft trials the trial of werewolves emerged in what is now switzerland so everybody's heard of the Salem witch trials and witch trials in Europe and things of that nature, but nobody really talks about the werewolf trials, which is pretty awesome. That's pretty fascinating because I mean yeah. I have a fascination with werewolves as well. That's sort of uh, I actually wear a werewolf uh, ring that was given to me uh, from my grandfather. But that's another story for another podcast. Uh, I think we could just do a whole podcast on werewolves in itself. And getting back again to... Well, 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 before you get off the werewolf topic, uh, there was doctors that would uh, argue about the... Uh, some, some doctors would say that it was a... It was uh, people who had reddish teeth and they had a psychosis uh, that their psychosis led them to believe that they were actually werewolves and so uh but there was a doctor named dr woodard who believed not this not to be true he believed that werewolves actually existed and he said because they these people look so much like wolves and yeah. even the doctor that tried to say that it was a psychosis problem he acknowledged the reddish sharp teeth wow so it's a possibility that uh, werewolves were real. I mean, if you look at farming communities where people are in the barn doing goats and stuff like that of that nature, 
Who's to say somebody didn't grab a hold of a wolf and spawn, spawn some uh, kids off of it or something? Well, you know, an interesting fact about werewolves and wolves, too, is that uh, part of the reason why I wear a werewolf ring as well is that uh, the wolf is my uh, spirit guide. And if you go on our website, worldparanormalresearchsociety.org, uh, you have my bio on there. And it's a very interesting fact. Uh, St. Francis Xavier in Manitoba, where my ancestor Cuthbert Grant Jr., uh, he originally called it Grant Town. We have a, a story that's famous for St. Francis Xavier in regards to a werewolf that lived around, lived within the community in the 1800s. So uh, the story is too long for me to mention now, but go to the website. It's under my uh, bio because I've included that because that's the, where my family has come from. Now, the people that they caught that they believe were werewolves, uh, this was the description of them. They had uh, the eyebrows met at the bridge of the nose. Mm -hmm. They had curved fingernails. This is actually a description from the doctors. And uh, they had curved fingernails. They had low set ears and a swinging stride. One method of identifying a werewolf in its human form was to cut the flesh of the accused under the pretense that fur would be seen within the wound. So you can imagine the accused standing in a courtroom and just being sliced because people thinking the fur is going to come out of it. Very, very interesting too. So, I mean, I, I find that topic fascinating. I remember uh, as a child, I think I was maybe five or six years old, I used to go on a vision quest with my grandfather in the bush. He was a trapper and, you know, we discussed a lot of things and he did tell me, he did talk about Wendigo and he did talk about werewolves and uh, folklore because he used to go uh, in Riding Mountain National Park or Duck Mountain National Park Park, moose hunting uh, at all you know to bring fam uh, meat for the family and he always told me I remember this specifically as a child that I was never to speak with a man uh, that had his eyebrows meeting in the center he told me to beware of a person like that because he was a werewolf slash windigo shapeshifter so that was a warning for my grandfather at a very small small age so I really grew up in that culture where uh, werewolves, windigos were real things and uh, you know the Cree people, uh, the Métis people have believed in that for hundreds and hundreds of years. One of the ways people uh, would, betr would try to become werewolves because there was a group of people that would try to become werewolves and one of the things that they would do and sometimes it's recorded as they would be successful is they would drink rain water out of the footprint of a wolf that's pretty interesting yeah. and I, I mean that people actually believe strongly enough to actually attempt that so i think but that's I, fascinating but after they did that they would have to sleep outside under the full moonlight wow that's amazing and uh in regards to uh, human windigos again in some traditions humans who became overpowered by greed could turn into windigos and the myth thus served as a method of encouraging cooperation and modernization. Humans could also turn into Wendigos by being in contact with them for a very, very long time. So there's a lot of actually um, taboo reinforcement ceremonies among the Assiniboine, the Cree, and the Ojibwe, where they did a ceremonial dance that they did perform during the times of famine to reinforce the seriousness of the Wendigo taboo. And um, the last known Wendigo ceremony conducted in the United States was at Lake Wendigo of Star Island of Cass Lake, located within the, Meet the Leech Lake Indian Reservation in northern Minnesota. There was a there was an 80 year old na man named Thies that in 1692 in Livonia he testified in the court of law that werewolves were actually the hounds of God and this was a testimony that he did uh, during the wolf trials and he would say that they, they would actually go down to hell and battle to make sure that uh, the devil and his minions did not carry off grains from local fellow crops down to hell. And he also said, said in the court of law that uh, by doing this, when the werewolves died, their souls were welcomed into heaven. 
I really think in 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 my way of thinking, I really think that uh, the Wendigo and the werewolf are one one in the same. It's just different cultures and different belief systems uh, calling them something different. But certainly, like I said, uh, werewolves. Uh, feature in my family in regards to that uh, legend where Cuthbert Grant Jr. came from and uh, again um, although distinct from how it appears in traditional lore one of the first appearances of a character inspired by or named after a Wendigo uh, in non-indigenous literature is Algerian Blackwood's 1910 short story The Wendigo and Blackwood's uh, work has influenced many of the subsequent portrayals in the mainstream horror fiction and uh, there was an author that did The Thing That Walked in the Wind in 1933 and 1941 and this actually inspired the character in Stephen King's novel Pet Cemetery. So Wendigo has inspired uh, mainstream horror writers or films in regards to uh, bringing them into uh, uh, popular uh, kind of myth and culture. And another kind of maybe fun tidbit that the Wendigo also appears in American comic books published by Marvel Comics. And it's created by the writer Steve Englehart and the artist Herb Trimple. And the monster is the result of a curse that afflicts those who commit acts of cannibal cannibalism in parts of Canada. And actually, the Wendigo first appeared in The Incredible Hulk, uh, number 162, which was April 1973, fighting the Incredible Hulk as well as Wolverine in his first comic book appearance. Yeah, and... Uh... You know, you talk about they're, they're also made a lot of good movies about the werewolf, the wolfman, the werewolf of London, the howling, the howling too being the best, of course. <laughs> we won't go into that, uh, the why or the the wow factor of that, but it was, I, I'm a fan of the howling movie series as well. And talking about movies that made of uh, the Wendigo, creatures based on Wendigo appear in a number of films including Dark Was the Night and Ravenous. And uh, they've also appeared in television series such as, again, Supernatural, Blood Ties, Charmed, Grimm, and Hannibal, where they feature features uh, creatures that uh, have uh, been kind of uh, Wendigo in uh, their kind of uh, uh, look. And another word for... Uh, well, uh, there's another one, Frankenstein Meets the Werewolf. Or meets the Wolfman. That came out in 1943. I haven't seen that one yet. I would love to see that one. Yeah, that seems like that would be uh, interesting when you when you when you kind of look at that. That would be interesting. And you did mention again Skinwalker as well, right? And a lot of people have asked the question: What happens if you get bitten by a Wendigo? So I mean, that, that may not be a question that comes <laughs> to your mind, but some people may want to know that. And it says, despite being undead, seeming mutant humans, Wendigos again. Let's face it, folks: Wendigos are not zombies, nor do they have an infectious bite. A person bitten by a Wendigo will not become one due to the attack attack only if they eat human flesh while a wendigo spirit is free to possess them and that's what it says in regards to some kind of weird facts about uh the wendigo so yeah there's many different forms of uh of shape shape shifters uh i think one of the best w werewolves when you talk about shape shifters werewolves are probably the most famous one of the best films I think that had the best design on the werewolf was a film that came out in the 80s called Waxwork. Uh, it came out in 1988 and uh, it, it features a werewolf in there. And then you have Werewolf in a Girl's Dormitory. That one was actually pretty funny. I like That's an older movie. I like that one. And the Werewolf of Washington, the Werewolf of Woodstock. Werewolf Rising, Werewolf Woman, The Werewolf is a 1913 silent film called The Werewolf. So if you go all the way back to 1913 and you see them making films about The Werewolf, they were closer to the legends 
and the myths than we are today because we kind of gotten away with uh, away from that a little bit you know so yeah there's just so many like you said every country every single country has their form of shapeshifters and uh, you know whether it's Canada there's Chile there's China Ethiopia France and uh, in France and French uh, speaking countries we call it la lugaru and uh, there's actually in Canada we have a postage stamp in regards to the werewolf because there's a lot of la lugaru uh, legends in regards to uh, people that are transforming into wolves when pe the early settlers came to Canada and uh, we remember we were in that museum in uh, New Orleans we seen that wolf and it says la lugaru they had a display of a wolf kind of a creature in that museum in New Orleans if I don't if I'm not standing You're talking about a voodoo yeah. yes they had that thing remember I said look at that and it was called la lugaru yeah I don't remember I remember specifically uh, I, I think I was vid videoing and taking pictures I probably didn't uh remember and that. even in Hawaii let's we haven't even covered Hawaii in Hawaii there are several shape-shifting legends which include uh, the famous uh, volcano goddess Pele who would shift into whatever appearance she wanted and there are also several shark shifter legends in Hawaii where you could change shape shift into a shark in Hawaii as well well let's talk about the definition of shape shifter the definition is one that seems able to change form or identity at will, especially a mythical figure that can assume different forms. Now we have different forms of shape-shifting animals already today, which still amaze me actually. If you look at frogs, frogs come from tadpoles. But if you think now, okay, so you have tadpoles that, that swim in the water, they grow up to be frogs. And then you look at, you know, butterflies. Shit, butterflies, do they become caterpillars or are they already caterpillars? How does that work? They're caterpillars that shape shift into a butterfly. Yeah, so that's a shape shifter if you think about it. What about flies? There Aren't they maggots first and yep. they shape shift into a fly? So really, you know what, if you sit down and you really think of, like we've given you a lot of facts, we've given you definition, all different cultures that have shape shifters, but if you sit down, take a moment and look at things in everyday life, they're shape shifters all around you I mean uh, you know there's an egg that transforms into a chick so that really could be uh, technically the definition of a shapeshifter mm. and go ahead and I'm you know even talking about uh, you know uh, in its crudest form we we are shapeshifters ourselves because if, we be, we come from the sperm meeting the egg and then we turn into an embryo or human being. like a tadpole that turns into a frog except the sperm turns into a little screaming brat. Here's the thing. <laughs> here's here, here here's another thing. If you walk into any bar and spend 3 to 4 hours there, you will always see a quiet person transform into a loudmouth asshole. Well, that's due to the alcohol. So yeah. the inducement of alcohol into the bloodstream can certainly make the quietest person turn into the loudest person in the bar. So, I mean, that's just another form of shape-shifting. And, uh, you know, in its basics, it's shape-shifting is any creature with the ability to undergo a drastic change of appearance can be consider, considered uh, a shapeshifter. And shapeshifters are not always evil, but they truly can be bloodthirsty, mischievous, helpful, or anything in between. And, uh, all, you know, beauty is probably the biggest trend in their appearance, where some people want to shapeshift. Uh, people can be um, people that like to dress in different clothing. That could be another shapeshifting. You're, you're changing, you're trans forming your appearance and uh really the shape shifters are definitely real and demons can shape shift into human like form and lead countries so yeah it's definitely something that's serious and real and uh yeah i mean we've seen uh in are you looking at uh what's what's the name of the dude from the kardashians that shape shifted into a female the dad oh I you know, oh Chris Jenner 
No, I think that's the woman, ain't it? What? Bruce Jenner. Bruce Jenner, pardon me. Bruce Jenner. That's how much of an impact I can't get yeah. the name straight. <laughs> we don't even watch that show. We hate that show. But the uh, Bruce Jenner, because uh, he was all over the news, shapeshifted himself through surgery into a female. Very ugly one, too. And you know what? Uh, we always say that, you know, we always want to, you know, kids are scared of the boogeyman. And really, in children's fairy tales, uh, which were first popularized by the Grimm Brothers and Hans Christian Andersen, and later they were actually commercialized by Walt Disney, also welcome shapeshifters into their pages. And in many cases, a beautiful prince or princess is trapped in in a monstrous form and their only hope of salvation is to find true love and examples of shape-shifting in children uh, you know Walt Disney is Beauty and the Beast the Swan Princess and of course my favorite is Shrek they are they all used this shape-shifting theme so Beauty and the Beast Shrek and the Swan Princess and um, but again, today, as Timothy has mentioned, today's most well-known shapeshifter, of course, is the werewolf. And that's the one that is most uh, prevalent uh, in today. And, uh, you know, there's different... A goblin can even be a shapeshifter. A djinn uh, can be a shapeshifter. There's just so many names that you can kind of really dissect into what you think a shapeshifter is. Yep. So... Uh, do you think they're real? What do you? What's your take? Like, I mean, other than yeah, folklore, well, they are real. De de demons shape shift into people, so yeah, I, I think I believe that they're out there. They exist. They're real, and uh, you know, I don't believe in the werewolf. I do not believe in the werewolf. I think at one time they used to exist, maybe way back, but I don't think they're out there now. What about the lizard people? That They, they said it's a government conspiracy. I've read a lot of information. I know Coast to Coast has covered a lot of these reptilian people, lizard people. They say that a lot of uh, high-ranking government officials are these reptilian or lizard people. That's they a say the of... royal family in England is part of the lizard people too, don't they? Yeah, and that, that would be considered a shapeshifter where they have these yeah, high-ranking... I, I, I don't believe that. I... I I just don't believe the royal families are uh, uh, lizard people. I don't believe it. Well, I don't believe that in itself, but I'm just saying that's just another example of a form of shape shifter that uh, that is out there. And, uh, you know, we have people that, you know, get transformed demonically and what have you. But uh, I really think that, uh, in my mind, shape shifters are real and again with my Cree indigenous background we have the Wendigo and I completely uh, believe in regards to them totally and I was referring in regards to the uh, reptilian uh, David uh, Eichel was writes the book and he has all these propaganda out there in regards to uh, the best reptilian shapeshifters in regards to the royal family I mean I'm not going to go into all that because I really don't think that that's relevant I mean that's his take on it I mean until I see proof uh, I'm not going to really really believe that and um, actually I'm going to sort of list uh, the 10 memorable shapeshifters from film and television maybe a lot of them you may not even uh, know um, Sam Merklot from True Blood was actually True Blood uh, is filled with uh, vampires uh, in regards to, uh, there's another one here, there's uh, Skylar Heroes, there is Alexandra Mack, The Secret World of Alex Mack. She was, ex you know, exposed to a chemical spell and she got, uh, who's another shapeshift? If anybody is a fan of X-Men, Mystique, she's the woman that's painted all in blue and all <coughs> that. She's considered a shapeshifter from the x X, uh, X Men movies. And in that same uh, category, you'd put Wolverine being the werewolf, but he uh, that was surgically done. So. What about uh, in uh, uh, um, Terminator 2? Uh, Arnold and all, they were shapeshifters. They could transform. Arnold wasn't a shapeshifter. The, the, the T, I think it was the T1000. Yeah, T1000 is considered a shapeshifter. Uh, Merlin uh, in the movie The Sword and the Stone. Um, actually, they say that. Uh, you know, there's so many people that they name here. There's uh, Odo in Star Trek Deep 
Space Nine. He was a shapeshifter. And again, you mentioned John Carpenter's movie, The Thing. Now, somebody that used uh, magic to shapeshift, one of the comedy shows that I like, The Monsters, Herman would try to shapeshift himself. Grandpa was always shapeshifting into a bat. One of the things I like to recommend for anybody to get out there is uh, Spider-Man and the Werewolf. It's, it's a team up. Spider-Man and the Werewolf team up. And if I could, I used to have that comic book. Man, if I could find that one today uh, in good condition, I would definitely buy it. And who could forget, of course, Doctor Who and the Doctor Who series. I love the original Doctor Who. He was a true uh, shapeshifter because he he uh, did. He was a time traveler where he could uh, shapeshift into different times. So the Hulk. Yes. Shapeshifted into a uh, big green monster. I actually started out gray, but yeah, now he's green. So. And uh, you know, there's just so many. Things that you may have not thought of of being shapeshifters and again you had mentioned American Werewolf in London the howling series and uh, there's actually uh, sleepwalkers as well there's so many different uh, movies that feature the theme of shape shifting and uh, it follows is another movie and uh, on and on with well, the blob mm, the blob was a shapeshifter in a way because it could shapeshift it it could take any shape uh, it, it wouldn't become a human form or anything, but it could it could flatten itself and go under doors or so it could change its shape. Its and what about shape. even with Michael J. Fox, uh, Teen Wolf? He was a shapeshifter. That uh, was a good movie, by the way. Yeah, Teen Wolf, Teen Wolf like with it. Michael J. Fox. That was yeah. good. Uh, again, we mentioned X-Men, uh, The Fly the Fly movie as well. Uh, there's just so many other movies. Um the Shaggy Dog? What about the Shaggy Dog? Yeah. He transformed, uh, the Shaggy Dog transformed into a dog. Uh, again, uh, so many, the Chronicles of Narnia have that, the fly again. Van Helsing. Van Helsing as well is a good, another good movie in regards to uh, shape-shifting. Just so many. So I think that's really given you a lot of, uh, a lot of things that you may have not thought about in regards to what is a shapeshifter it's a hell of a lot more than just transforming into an animal uh, really you could just tear this subject apart well, well because the berserkers as it's thought that the berserkers would actually take the powers of the animal and so and win wars with them so yeah it's just absolutely you know it just kind of blows my mind that there really hasn't been more out there about shapeshifters it doesn't seem like it's a topic that's covered too too much because it's such a huge topic that every like I said every single culture has a story in myth and legend going back from the past now into uh, um, the present and uh, let's face it folks all these cultures and his uh, countries all have the common theme in regards to what a shapeshifter is as well and uh there used to be a comic book series called Crack Comics, and they have uh, they had a werewolf in that one. And uh, if you can ever find that, it's, it's issue number 51, Crack Comics. That's definitely another one I'd like to add to my collection. And if you ever see, if you see a lot of werewolf stuff, and you might see them having some tie-in with the Nazis theme or whatever, and some of the artwork or stuff. And the only reason that is is because Hitler had a uh, one of his hideouts, one of his command posts was called the Werewolf, and so uh, that's why you see on comics sometimes you'll see when a reference to Nazis when you see the Werewolf or whatever. Wow! And uh, another kind of uh, we forgot to mention that some of the shapeshifters can be two different creatures. In the Philippines, the Aswang is a vampire werewolf who transforms from a human to a canine form at night and eats human flesh. And it also manifests itself as a decaying corpse that has been severed at the waist and it has bat wings so they're closely related to other legends so of ghouls a ghoul can be a shapeshifter as well so uh, I mean, yeah we cover that werewolf is just one of the most we didn't cover the ghoul thing but i'm saying we covered a topic that where a shapeshifter can be anything it doesn't have to just be a werewolf we, we refer to the werewolf mainly mainly for the fact that it's uh it's the most popular one however dracula 
vampirisms vampire would be also another popular one when people don't think of it as shapeshifter but when these people are turning into bats that's shapeshifting well even as another example in serbia they have uh it's called the ward luck and it's a werewolf that died and became a vampire so in some countries you can be a werewolf and a vampire in, you know after one after the other so that's uh, kind of interesting how they can have that fact so I really think that you know what I hope that uh, this will kind of uh, open your eyes a little bit and kind of make you do research and as Timothy always likes to say always check your sources uh, you know there's so many different uh, sources and not everything that you read on the internet is true folks get out and get a book and uh, you know, we have a lot of good books that we've uh, written out there. Uh, Timothy has Vlad the Impaler. I have The Goatman. I have The Blood Countess. So we have a lot of different interesting topics out there in regards to some of the things that, you know, even The Goatman that we have accounted in a lot of our investigations. So hopefully that you will do your own research and uh, you again will expand your horizons and I hope this is a topic that you found interesting I certainly find it interesting like I said growing up with all these legends uh, in my culture and um, I do believe in uh, the Wendigo very strongly they do a, a Halloween event in Lower Fort Gary uh, where they actually have a Wendigo where he runs out from the woods and scares all the people so these legends are true and I think it absolutely fascinating folks and please uh, get a book or do some research and you know find out what's where you're from in the world what the legend is regards to Wendigo. <laughs> It's actually real wolves howling right there. And as Dracula would say, real children wolves. of the night. That's a real wolf howling. Beautiful sound. I love uh, uh, the sound of wolves howling. The children of the night, folks. Beautiful. What beautiful music they make. That would be up for us today. We'll, uh... We're going to be bringing a lot more exciting guests to you, so stay tuned. You're not going to want to miss it on a lot of varied topics. Thanks, and take care. Yeah, and uh, I recommend a song out there for people to listen to. Hair the Dog by Nazareth. Really good song. Y'all have a good day. Bye. Bye.